So we're here, once again, Plaza San Martin. Plaza San Martin, where we visited in our uh, video about the central plazas of Mendoza. Beautiful Plaza San Martin. Um, we're here on a hot day. <laughs> They're all hot days here, but that's okay. We're sitting in the shade, and uh, you can see the statue right there. Let me flip the camera around. There he is, right there, once again, San Martin. And today we are here in the Plaza San Martin because we've we've been to a lot of Plaza San Martins. We went to this Plaza San Martin, went to the Plaza San Martin in the middle of uh, Cordoba. We've been to the uh, Plaza de General San Martin in Buenos Aires. We've been to so many of these things. And there's even a park here in Mendoza, big, big open green space um, called Parque de San Martin. There's a lot of stuff named after San Martin, Jose de San Martin, and the reason is because he is uh, possibly one of the most important historical figures in the history of Latin America. And today, we're going to learn about why. Before we do that, I just want to say real quick thank you very much for watching the video. Click the like button and the subscribe button and leave a comment down below. It's free, it's easy, and it will help the channel grow and help this content reach other YouTube viewers. All right, back to the video. So we can take a little walk, talk about San Martin a little bit, Jose de San Martin. Also, talk about what we're going to be doing in this video. So really, there's a couple of places here in the city of Mendoza that we want to go see that are related to San Martin. And the city of Mendoza is actually really, really important uh, to, well, the life of San Martin, but also to, like, his accomplishments, his main accomplishments, being that he is the liberator of Argentina, Chile, and Peru. So he wasn't, wasn't just, he's not just a hero in Argentina, he's a hero in all three of those countries. And I've never been to Chile or Peru. That may change in the future. But uh, I would imagine there's a lot of stuff named after him there too. Let's try not to get run over in the street and talk about why San Martin is so important. So he was born here in Argentina, not here in Mendoza, but over in uh, what is now Corrientes province. And uh, his father, Juan de San Martin, was actually the like governor of 30 or so um, Guarani missions over in Corrientes. Now these are missions that, if you'll remember from our video that we made in Cordoba about uh, the Jesuits, link in the description to those two videos actually, um, the Jesuits were expelled. 1767, they were expelled from the Spanish colonies. But they still had all these, you know, properties, ranches that were Guarani settlements, um, where Guarani, the native uh, native people here before the Spanish, were still like working on encomiendas, which is like uh, like a big plantation, basically, with forced labor. Um, and the Spanish, of course, weren't going to give that up. So they took one of their own guys and put him in charge. And that guy was Juan de San Martin. And he lived there until he was like six or seven years old, I think. And then uh, his father requested a transfer back to Spain, to mainland Spain. And that's where um, uh, Jose was educated. He was educated in Spain. And he entered the military at uh, quite a young age, actually, when he was like... I don't know, 13 or something like that. Basically, by the time he was 15 years old, Jose de San Martin was like a, a junior lieutenant, basically. He was like a junior officer in the Spanish Navy, uh, which is crazy by today's standards. But, I mean, when you think about it, like, people didn't live very long back then. The life expectancy was pretty short. People grew up fast. I feel like there wasn't much of a childhood, and there were definitely no such thing as a teenager. So, uh, yeah, that was it. 15 years old, he was already like an officer in the Navy. So his military career uh, started very early, and it started in the Spanish military. That was in like 1793, and, you know, within 10 years or so, uh, he was already uh, a colonel, I believe, a lieutenant colonel in, uh, in the Spanish military. And a colonel would be like in charge of a whole lot of like a big group of troops. Um, and this is a time, you know, in the like very early 1800s when 
there was a lot of stuff happening, historically speaking. Um, if you study history, it seems like sometimes there are periods where like not a lot happens, especially depending on like where you where you live in the world. Um, but this is a time when a lot of stuff was happening. Uh, I'm talking about just um, you know, 25 years or so after the uh, Revolutionary War in the United States of America. I'm talking like just after the uh, French Revolution and at the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars. And that is a period of history where like a lot of stuff changed all across the world. Not just in Europe, but um, in the colonies over here in the Americas as well. Lots of things changed in a very short, short period of time. Um, and arguably like Jose de San Martin was kind of like in the thick of it for most of that, you know? He, uh, he commanded troops during the Peninsular War, which was uh, the Napoleonic War in the Iberian Peninsula, which France and Spain had allied to uh, essentially try and take over Portugal, um, which they successfully did. But afterwards, Napoleon decided to occupy Spain, depose King Ferdinand, and uh, put his own uh, brother, I believe, Joseph, Joseph Bonaparte, in as uh, King of Spain. This, of course, did not go over well with a lot of people in Spain, and uh, you end up with, shortly after the war for Spanish independence, which is basically them fighting a war to try and uh, overthrow Bonaparte and put uh, Ferdinand back on the throne. Now, the Napoleonic War is, like, super, super complicated. So much going on. So many uh, countries involved. So many, uh, well, at that point, not really countries. Kingdoms, basically. But so many powers involved. Um, so many people involved. We could make an entire channel all about the Napoleonic Wars. And I'm sure there probably are channels all about the Napoleonic Wars. And that's not what we're here to talk about in this video. But it's important to note that, like... It's, it's a very, very complicated, and what I'm giving you is very, very, very brief, top surface level uh, version of the events, specifically as they're related to our guy, Jose de San Martin. Okay, so the museum is right up here, just uh, on this block. In fact, I think it's, uh, we're coming up on it right here. Museo Historico General de San Martin. All right, so let's check this place out. Um, I, I looked up some like Google reviews for this place. It looks like it kind of has mixed reviews, but I don't know. I'd like to check it out. I'm interested. So inside the museum, and there is a lot of stuff in here. flag of the Army of the North. Piano of Juan Augustine Maza. I think this is like, yeah, a recreation of uh, San Martin's... Well, actually, these may actually be I wonder if these are actual, like, pieces of his furniture. I think these are actually, actually his, actually some of his things. A clock, a little desk, a chair, right there. That's where San Martin's butt was. I keep saying San Martin, like referring to him as Saint Mar Martin. It, it's not him. He's Jose de San Martin, but I'm a dumb American. What can I say? These preserved fans, you know, this is like we saw this in the um, House of Sobramante. This all, all this stuff is the same era as like Sobramante, early 1800s, and uh, I'm still amazed at how they're able to preserve like paper and lace fans this long after this much time. It's really amazing. This is actually a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be when we came in. 
there's a whole a whole walkthrough area over here with all kinds of stuff. So an old sewing machine. Interesting. There's a lot of paintings in here, but no, or at least no, uh, like there's no identification identification tags. Some of them have them, like this one. And I don't know. I think a lot of this stuff. I can't tell exactly how it's related to uh, to Jose de San Martin. But it is cool to see a lot of old stuff like this. Always like seeing that. Map of Mendoza. Mendoza province. Quite old, 1892. But see, this is what I mean. Like, a, you know, map of Mendoza province, 1892. That's well after San Martin is already, or Jose de San Martin is already dead. So, what is this? Hmm. Oh, here. So this is like 1858. This is an interesting because this shows the earthquake. Like what um, the when we did our first video here in Mendoza. This is Plaza um, de Pedro del Castillo, where the first um, center of the city was, and then of course the earthquake. And now it's what this is what it looks like now. Saw that in the first video. There will be a link to that video down in the description. These, I think, are all about the earthquake. Yeah, you can see pictures of the ruins after the earthquake. And uh, interesting to see. It really is such an important event, probably the most important event in the history of the city of Mendoza. I don't know who this guy is, but. He's got some really, really, really awesome sideburns. Oh, tch. I spoke too soon. Look at this. Wow. Okay. Been looking at sideburns for too long. Oh, hey, this is uh, Domingo uh, Faustino Sarmiento right here. I recognize this guy. The Peatonal Sarmiento in the center of Mendoza, named after this guy, former president of Argentina. And, uh, oh, wow, look at this. Look at these military uniforms. Oh. I wonder if the, these are like, are these originals? Wait a minute, hold on a second. We gotta look a little closer here. Colonel Osvaldo Godoy. Colonel Luis Lavari. I wonder, okay, my first question is, are these real or are they recreation, recreations? I think they're real. My second question is, are they actually from the uh, Army of the Andes? Because, like I mentioned, a lot of the stuff in this museum so far has been kind of like not really related. <laughs> Some of it's been kind of like not really related to San Martin, as far as I can tell. But... I mean, if these are the, if these were the actual uniforms that like some of the some of the guys in the Army of the Andes wore, I mean that would be that'd be pretty crazy. They look a little newer though. I mean, they don't they look kind of like eight, late 1800s era. And the Army of the Andes, you know, they crossed the Andes in 18 what 17. So I don't know. Yeah, see, they, they have these here with these paint, or these uh, lithographs here that are 1879. And that's what this stuff looks like to me, my untrained eye. This looks like a more like 1879 era um, uniforms. Although, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone knows better in the comments and they can let me know. Swords and guns. The boys' favorite toys. Now let's see. Some of these, uh, like this one here, that's a, like a repeating rifle. So that's much later than Army of the Andes, early 1800s. 
a lot of these are. Some of these muskets are probably like back in that era, but like this thing, this thing here, and this one below, those are like repeater carbines. Those are way out, 18, late, mid to late 1800s. See now this, okay, this right here, this looks more like the actual grenadiers because I've seen pictures of the uniforms of the grenadiers and that looks more like it. Yeah, see here, crossing the Andes. That's what they looked like more, which looks a lot more similar to that. I think some of those other uniforms over there may have been from like a later period. I don't know who this guy is. Got that awesome mustache though. These look like old letters. What are these from? 1820, huh? Yeah, so this is this is definitely San Martin's era, 1820. Those are really cool. I always, I always mention that I really like seeing people's actual handwriting. You know, you see like the actual stuff that they wrote in their handwriting. Like when we were in the uh, uh, Casa de che, che Guevara, and they had his journals that were like in his handwriting. Those are pretty cool. Link to that video down in the description. Another piano over here. This is interesting. This piano has. Uh, like little candle holders on it, because of course, pre-electricity, gotta get by with candlelight, you wanna play piano at night. Sala Familiar, I don't know, San Martin. This is like what his bedroom would have looked like. Oh, here's uh, pictures of, I guess this is his daughter? She was born when he was here in, um, when he was here in Mendoza for the two and a half years that he was here. These looks like more letters or journals. Wow. Escritos. Escritos originales que no dan del año 1814. So these are original writings from 1814. room here. It is cool to see like a recreation sort of of what the furniture looked like. But you don't see a lot of these because you know there's a lot of things that were from that era pre-1861 were destroyed in the earthquake. So you either get to see <laughs> the ruins of something or you get to see the you know the furniture that they were able to salvage but it's here in you know a museum in a new building. Not like uh, in Cordoba, you go to like the Casa de Sabramante. It's like his furniture is right there in his house. So once again, you know, the earthquake changed a lot of things around here, that's for sure. Looks like there's more back here. Oh, okay, so this, yeah. This is like original stuff from the house. Now this is the house of Sobramante, Casa de Sobramante, which we're actually gonna go and visit later in this video. I mean, it's just the ruins of it, of course. They built a museum on top of it, but we're gonna go check that out. Like I said, there's a lot of uh, stuff mixed in here that I don't know is completely related to Jose de San Martin, but it is interesting to see it all here, all in one place. I think we've seen what we can see here. Probably time to head out. So that was alright. I think uh, some of the reviews that I had read online said that it was kind of like dingy and uh, a little like un disorganized. And 
those reviews are definitely right. It was kind of dingy and a little disorganized, but I mean, it was still interesting to go and see all that stuff, even if a lot of it wasn't, you know, directly related to Jose de San Martin. But anyway, I think now is probably a good time. We'll talk a little bit more about San Martin. Then afterwards, we can go, uh, we can go visit the Casa de San Martin. So after the Napoleonic Wars, which in Spain ended with the defeat of Joseph Bonaparte and the uh, return of Ferdinand, returned back to the throne, um, at that point, that was uh, 1814, and our guy Jose de San Martin came back over here to the Americas. And there's sort of a dispute on what his motivations were for leaving Spain and coming back over here, um, but ultimately it led to him um, organizing uh, a revolution uh, and helping with the independence movement against the Spanish to free all of the Spanish colonies here in South America uh, from the Spanish Empire. Now the Spanish Empire had been like severely, severely weakened during um, during the Napoleonic Wars. Of course, like King Ferdinand was literally deposed from the throne and replaced by someone else. So the, their power was significantly weakened. So when Jose de San Martin arrived back in uh, in Argentina, at that time the United Provinces of Rio de la Plata, uh, he joined up with the United Provinces of Rio de la Plata. And because he had military experience, he offered his services. And he was given the task of uh, raising a cavalry regiment, which at the time in Argentina, they didn't really have a good cavalry force. And uh, so he raised the Regiment of Mounted Grenadiers and their first battle was in San Lorenzo in Argentina. Now they had uh, tracked um, a Spanish naval force that was sort of like going along the coast and raiding settlements and pillaging. And they had tracked them to San Lorenzo. And from there, they, uh, Jose de San Martin sort of like held back so that they didn't know that they were being followed, the Spanish, and uh, waited until they disembarked onto the shore to raid in San Lorenzo, and he sort of caught him out in the open um, in, a, in a big field and managed to split his forces into like two pincers and pin them in, flank them, and defeat him in the field. And afterwards, he actually, uh, the story goes, had breakfast with the commander of the Spanish force and uh, convinced the Spanish uh, commander to like defect with his men over to the uh, to the revolution. So, not only was he pretty smart militarily, but uh, also pretty good at convincing people. The interesting thing is that uh, for all of his uh, his glory and all the statues and plazas and everything that's named after him, that's really his only time com uh, commanding troops um, in battle here in Argentina. Is that battle? Because afterwards, um, you know, because of his accomplishments, he was promoted. And when you get promoted up in the military beyond a certain point, like he got promoted to general, you're not really commanding troops in battle anymore on the field. You're just sort of like in charge of people who are commanding troops in the field. So after his promotion to general, uh, in 1814, King Ferdinand regained the throne, the Spanish throne. And uh, as one of his first acts, he uh, immediately started to send out military forces and uh, give orders to royalists in the colonies here to basically to squash all these rogue colonies who were trying to uh, fight for independence. And that's of course enough for our guy Jose de San Martin to start to organize his own, um, his own plan to raise an army in the colonies, raise an army in Argentina, and use that army to uh, to free and liberate colonies, uh, including Argentina, in Chile, in Peru, and uh, this was the Army of the Andes. And in order to uh, to raise that army, he needed to be here in Mendoza because his plan was to raise an army here, cross over the Andes into Chile, liberate Chile, and use Chile as the uh, point where he could uh, raise a navy to then sail up to Peru to liberate Peru. And that's the time period when he lived here in Mendoza. Uh, but 
interestingly, when he was living here in 1814 to 1816, I mean, he was governor of Kusho province. He had actually requested to be governor of Kusho province, which was what Mendoza province, of course, was called back then with the capital here in Mendoza City. And the reason that he had did that, because he wanted to use his power as governor to put the entire province on like war mobilization footing, which he did. He had, uh, you know, everybody mining for saltpeter and lead and copper and all the things that they were going to need. He had people making weapons and uh, raising, you know, raising troops from the population here of uh, not just uh, of the, the population, but also um, from the slave population here. He uh, liberated slaves in order to uh, to put them in the army, basically saying, you know, if you join the army of the Andes, you'll be you'll be liberated. When they crossed the Andes, they they lost a good amount of the the mules, the horses, supplies. I mean, it's it's rough crossing the Andes. Okay, so here it is, Casa de San Martin, and of course it doesn't look like the Casa de San Martin because the actual casa uh, collapsed, and it's basically just. Uh, ruins that this museum was built on top of but the whole floor on the first floor is glass and underneath you can see the like floor plan the outline the, the ruins of the Casa de San Martin so uh, let's go ahead and head in there and take a look so for some reason the audio got corrupted on this part but I'll put a voiceover in trying to recreate what I was saying you can see the ruins here um, what's what's left over and this part right here is actually exposed, so you can see some of the mosaic on the tiling. And they have pictures here of like buildings that were built on top of the site um, because the you know where where the house was it had collapsed such a long time ago. They rebuilt on top of it, and only recently did you know they tear down these buildings and build the museum on top of the site and sort of excavate what uh, what was below the parts of the Casa de San Martin and the entire floor the first floor is all glass you can see all the um, different areas of the of the house underneath and they also have some you know some artifacts pottery and things like that that they found um, in different places around the house when they were excavating the site so it's really cool to be uh, to be walking around on top of it and be able to see exactly how it was laid out. Um, a lot of museums like this, um, like the one, for example, that we visited at the center of Mendoza, the old center, um, that was cool too, but there was only a small area that was glass over like this. And you're sort of looking at the, the ruins from outside, and it's really cool to walk over them and like look at them um, underneath you. Uh, here there are some like pictures of the what the site used to look like, old sort of floor plans. They give you an idea of exactly what it was like and old sketches to, to show what it would have looked like before um, you know before it collapsed and before it was all lost and destroyed. And then there's a map that shows sort of like what where it was located on the on the uh, like an older much older map of Cordoba, uh, 1822. This map, so before you know, 40 years or so before the earthquake that knocked down pretty much the whole city, and then an artist sketch of um, sort of like what the area looked like around it. It's really extensive. The entire uh, the entire glass covering it. They they basically built the the um, museum to sort of the same size as what the house would have been and as far as you know a house it was probably pretty nice i mean he was governor of cujo at the time and the governor's house if you're in a spanish colony is going to be pretty pretty nice but um, regardless of how nice it was this was a time when you know he was focused on raising the army so while he was living here and probably living in style um, he was also working pretty hard to make sure that the army was raised and ready to go to uh, to march over the Andes, and over here they have a little information about uh, about San Martin and uh, his education, um, and like when he came back from 
Spain to, uh, to the Rio de la Plata, to Argentina, and talking about his family because actually his daughter was born here while he was living here. In the two and a half years while he was living here, his daughter was born. The birthplace of his daughter, Merceditas, and here explaining San Martin, Gobernador, in the, in, Gobernador Intendiente de Cujo. The uh, San Martin, the governor of Cujo. Cujo province, of course, is what they used to call Mendoza province back in the day. Then here they show an interesting thing. This is Paseo Alameda, which is a little walking trail through the city that's uh, lined by poplar trees. And this is actually something that um, that is still there. You can still walk along it today in the city. But it was something that um, that San Martin had had put up as like a nice place in the city. So while he was in the city, even though he was you know raising the army of the Andes, as you can see here, crossing the Andes, he was also doing good things for the city. And then this is a section talking about him crossing the Andes with the army. And upstairs, they have um, they have more detail on the different sections of the army that he put together and the different passes they would have to go through, Paso de Planchon and uh, Paseo, Paso de Portillo. So these are the different mountain passes that, tra that go in between um, the places where you can like cross from this side of the Andes to the other side of the Andes. And that was the thing. When he put together this army, he had to split it up into you know five or six different uh, groups that would go across in different passes. And the way they did it was they split the groups up, they went across through these different passes, and when they got over to the other side in Chile, they basically just started an insurrection. Like, get over to the other side and start causing trouble. Get the Spanish to have to split their forces into much smaller groups in order to take on, um, you know, these insurrections that were happening in all these different places in Chile. And once they had split their forces, the Spanish were vulnerable, and at that point, they could uh, do the same maneuver that they did in his first battle here in Argentina, split off into like a pincer movement and entrap the Spanish in, um, in open ground that they would find. So basically fighting a guerrilla war over in, uh, in, in Chile, and it worked. And you could see here this map, which uh, shows all the different passes and all the routes that all the different groups of the army, once they were split up, went through. So there are all the different passes and the map showing exactly where they went across. And you can see it, it was quite a large territory from, um, from all the way up north around uh, Puerto Viejo and Huasco down to La Serena and then all the way down to, of course, the capital um, in, in Santiago, Chile. And Lots of, lots of different battles were fought over on the other side. Every time you see a crossed sword, that's a, a battle that was fought over there. And so it wasn't just one giant battle. They split up into groups and had to fight lots of little battles over there in Chile. And they were successful. Then here is the flag of Mendoza with the crest of Argentina on it. flag of the Andes, La Manera de los Andes, with the crest of Argentina on it. And here it's explaining what, uh, you know, what each piece of the, uh, of the crest is and what, what it signifies. Well, those are pretty cool. And of course the, uh, the story of San Martin doesn't end here in Mendoza at the, uh, at the house where he lived, you know, because he was successfully able to lead the army of the Andes over the Andes into Chile. Uh, fight what was basically like um, kind of like a you know an insurrection in Chile and liberate Chile raise a navy sail up to Peru liberate Peru it's a whole more another story like I said there's a long history here it's long and very complex and uh, we don't really have time to talk about all of it just in this video when we're talking about all these things it's not you can't look at it from the point of view that we have modern 
with nation states, nation states that have governments, governments that control armies. It wasn't like uh, the state of Argentina and the official, you know, national military of Argentina made him a general and then ordered him to go do all these things and then he went and did all these things. That's really not how it worked back then. I mean, this is a loose confederation of provinces that really didn't have hardly any central leadership. And what it came down to was, uh, did you have the money to, or could you source the money to be able to pay for all the stuff you were gonna need, including paying all your soldiers and your sailors, buying all your ships and your weapons? Like, did you have the money to be able to raise an entire army or a navy to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish? And if you had that, then you could go out and do that. And so I think an important thing to remember about uh, specifically San Martin and Jose de San Martin and guys like him were that not only were they, uh, you know, like militarily capable and not only did they have, did they accomplish things militarily, but they had to also be like um, very diplomatic and they had to have connections and they had to know how to um, how to work the politics and the inner workings of the former colonies here. They had to know, um, you know, have connections to sources of power and income and capital um, here in the colonies. So there was a lot of political and diplomatic networking that was going on outside of strictly military, tactical, and strategic things. So it's important to remember that because, like I said, it's not like it is today. Back then, in the midst of all of this, there were uh, what was basically like civil wars between factions, different power factions within the colonies. Faction, like provinces fighting against provinces, uh, power factions within those provinces fighting against each other. And having to network that whole mess and still be able to, uh, to raise an army, raise a navy, go and fight these battles and liberate these places is, uh, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty amazing feat that he was able to do it. And that's probably why there are statues of him all over the place. Anyway. Parque San Martin is a huge, huge open uh, green space, urban green space in the city. It's comparable to like a Central Park in New York or Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C., Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. If you want to get an idea of how big it is, I would say it's probably like the size of three or four neighborhoods in Mendoza. Um, the neighborhood of the Central Plazas, where we did our video, um, you know, like I said, that's probably like that whole area with the central plazas and the surrounding blocks. It's probably like five or six blocks on each side. And you could fit probably four or five, maybe even six of those in the area of Parque San Martin. So it is absolutely gigantic. Um, and the whole thing, of course, dedicated to our guy, Jose de San Martin. So we're here at the monument to the Army of the Andes. El Monumento al Ejército de uh, los Andes. Look at that thing. It's amazing. It is, one, it's huge. It's absolutely gigantic. It's like its own mountain, and it's up here on top of a hill. The hill is uh, the uh, Cerro de, de Gloria, Cerro de la Gloria, the Hill of Glory. On the front, La Patria, El Ejército de los Andes. Ejército means army, so this is the army of the Andes. And right up on top, in the very front, is General San Martin. The reason we're here, Jose de San Martin. And on the sides, you can see these other guys on horses. Those are like his grenadiers, right? like the army that he raised. And above him, on the front face, 
is like the north face of the sculpture or of the monument. You can see the crest of Argentina. And there's a crest of Chile and a crest of Peru also. Around on this side, this is the, uh, the west side. You can see up there the crest of Chile with the star. And then on the other side, there's the crest of Peru right there because San Martin, of course, is known as the liberator of Argentina, Chile, and Peru. And on the sides here, there are these, these like murals, basically, fraises, fr fr sculpted mural that goes all the way around. And it basically like tells the story of the army of the Andes. On the top, you can see the, the, like the biggest, largest sculpture, the largest statue. And this one towers over the rest. And that is, well, she represents liberty. You can see she's got angel's wings and she's holding broken chains. And she's surrounded by grenadiers. So these are the horse, the, you know, uh, grenadiers on horseback of the army of the Andes. The sculptor was Juan Manuel Ferrari. He's uh, from Uruguay, and, uh, but he studied in Buenos Aires, and he studied in Rome, and he sculpted this. This was, um, I think, finished in 1914, and then Ferrari died just afterwards in 1916. From the top of the hill here in Parque San Martín, you can get a beautiful view of the whole valley all the way out to the foothills of the Andes. Future Gary here with a fresh new haircut because the Gary you know and love from that video forgot to record an outro. But hopefully now you're familiar with Jose de San Martin, one of the most important figures in all of Latin American history, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Stick around, we're gonna have uh, more videos, like I said, inspired by the four outer plazas of the city of Mendoza. Lots of good stuff to come, and with that, we will see you in the next video.